Hello, everyone, and thank you for being with us for this virtual tour of the Fairfield University Art Museum. My name is Jessica Colligan, and I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of Fairfield's Alumni Relations Office. Our tour guides this evening are Carrie Mack Weber, who is the director of the museum and also the curator of this exhibition, and Michelle DeMarzo, who is the museum's curator of education and academic engagement. Michelle is also an alumna of Fairfield, a member of the class of 2007, and we're so happy to have both of them with us tonight. Before we get started, I want to ask that you please keep your microphones muted throughout the tour just to minimize background noise. But that said, Carrie and Michelle do want this to be interactive as if you were attending a tour in person at the museum. So please feel free to submit any questions that you have via the chat feature in Zoom, and we will get to as many of them as we can. And now I will turn things over to Carrie and Michelle to get us started. Well, thank you, Jessica, and thank you to the Alumni Relations Office for inviting Carrie and I to be here with you this evening. We are so delighted that we can make this virtual tour of Birds of the Northeast Gulls to Great Ox possible when we've been very disappointed that the museum has been closed to the outside public because of the con continuing pandemic situation. And as Jessica said, we're hoping to make this in some ways a tour that we would have in the gallery. But of course, since we have virtual means at our fingertips, we are going to take full advantage of them. Uh, so I wanna just give you a little bit of a sense about how the next 40 minutes or so is going to play out. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to start a video that was beautifully produced by the university's media center, giving you a full overview of the exhibition. Um, after that, I will introduce Carrie, who is going to give you a little bit of a background if you're not familiar with the museum, and she's going to talk about this exhibition from the perspective of a curator, since she co-curated the exhibition with three members of Fairfield's biology department. After that, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a preview of all of the wonderful goodies that can be found on our website, which is fairfield.edu slash museum slash birds of the Northeast. You wanna be exploring in advance. And then Carrie and I are going to trade off, um, highlighting a couple of the objects in the show that we particularly like and sharing some of our thoughts on them with you. And as Jessica said, at the end, we'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have to the best of our ability. So without further ado, I'm gonna hop over to our YouTube channel. If I can escape out of my PowerPoint. There we go. Of course, this is never as smooth as you envision it being. So make this full screen. Thank you. 
So I hope you all enjoyed as much as I did watching oh, that. No, we're life. not going to let you play. Easy to take for granted. Like you out of there. Away. Uh, enjoyed that sort of overview of the exhibition and I'll be showing you in um, a few moments where you can watch that video again on our website. And now without further ado, I would like to introduce the museum's executive director and co-curator of this exhibition, Carrie Weber. Hi everybody, thanks so much for being with us here this evening. Um, it is my great joy to be able to give you all a, a, a taste of this exhibition. Um, as Michelle said, we're so sad that you're not able to see it in person, but um, it uh, was really one of the highlights of my career to be able to curate this um, with my colleagues in the biology department. And uh, we're gonna um, try and give you as much flavor of it as we can in this virtual environment. So uh, next slide, Michelle. I'm gonna just jump into talking about um, sort of the process of curation, how the exhibition came to be. Um, as, uh, as you saw, we're celebrating our 10th year um, this year, um, this entire academic year. And I've been the director just for about two years. And one of my goals um, when I um, started in this position was really to try and do more interdisciplinary exhibitions and really take advantage of the wonderful faculty partners we have across campus. So um, I had the idea of birds, I'll tell you in a minute, how I kind of started with that germ of, I, germ of an idea, but I wanna give credit to my three faculty co-curators, um, Brian Walker, Jim Biardi, and Todd Osher. Um, having them as partners really made it possible to make this exhibition something kind of unique. I mean, you can see exhibitions about birds and uh, highlighting incredible artwork from, you know, across the centuries in, in many museums. But being an academic art museum and working with our colleagues in biology gave us the opportunity to make it something more than just an art exhibition. So we, um, with our partnership, were able to, in addition to the art historical labels, create scientific labels. It's some interesting facts about the birds who were being um, depicted. We were able to um, create this bird guide that you see here. Um, this is uh, based on 10 years of Todd Osher's work on campus. He's an ornithologist and he takes his students around um, our beautiful campus and looking at birds, listening to bird songs. And these are all birds that have been sighted on campus um, over the last 10 years, some migratory, some local. Um, and um, our student intern from the biology department um, made a fabulous playlist of all the bird songs of these birds and helped us with the labels. We were also able to um, expand our programming much further than I think we would have um, with just a normal art exhibition and um, had some really fantastic um, uh, science type lectures, which Michelle will talk about in a little while. Um, next slide. So um, I, I had the idea to do an exhibition of birds, bird art, avian art, um, when I came across this Marston Hartley painting in the center of the slide, which I'll talk much more about later. Um, it really is the centerpiece of the exhibition. And when I found out that it was possible to borrow this painting from the Art Bridges Foundation, which is the foundation arm of the Crystal Bridges Museum um, in Arkansas, um, I was, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Marston Hartley. And I, I was just thrilled at, at the potential um, that this painting represented to me. So I, I quickly started um, all the steps necessary to borrow the painting, which um, um, I'll talk about that a little bit more later too. Um, Art Bridges was incredibly generous in their loan. Um, soon thereafter, I saw the, the uh, portfolio that you saw on the main wall in the, in the exhibition of the 12 prints that are based on Audubon's um, work by Matthew Day Jackson, the wild turkey on the left in honor of our wild turkeys on campus. Um, that, uh, that series, um, which Michelle is gonna talk more about, really um, struck a chord with me. Um, it, it kind of summed up everything I wanted to achieve in this exhibition and highlighting um, the really fragile state of uh, our ecology and, and the danger that birds are in um, 
from habitat loss um, and, and growing extinctions. And then I met Todd McGrain, whose work is on the right, the, um, the bronze sculpture, um, and uh, learned about his project, which is called the Lost Bird Project, which we'll talk more about. But anyway, these were the three um, works that really um, formed the foundation and kind of gave um, gave the the exhibition structure, um, which we'll we'll talk more about next. So, in addition to those works, um, we were able to have some works created specifically for the exhibition, which was really exciting. Um, I I just watching that video again of the exhibition. I was so taken with how the media center was able to capture the birds on the left, the Paul Valinsky. Um, long playing birds, the work is called, how he, they were able to really make it appear as they, though they are in flight, even though they're pinned to the walls of the gallery. Um, so we had worked with Paul Valinsky on a previous exhibition. He had um, lent some works to a show we did called Guns in the Hands of Artists. And um, I, I knew that he had done work with birds. So I reached out to him and he created this for us. And then the other two works are by an artist named Emily Eveleth, who's someone I happen to know personally. And I'd always wanted to show Emily's works. And I said, Emily, do you feel like painting some works for this exhibition? And she said, sure. So she painted these two and she said, so I painted two, which one would you like to put in the exhibition? And I said, there is no way I can choose one of these. <laughs> they're so different and they're so um, fabulous, both of them. And again, really, you know, I had talked about the exhibition with her, but she really captured the idea of, you know, this, this bright, vibrant backyard bird that everyone knows, the, the cardinal, and then the precariousness of, of a bird's life um, in, in painting it um, as a non-living bird. Next, please. So as the show was coming together, um, everything was going really well. We were adding a lot of works. Uh, we were pretty much done with the checklist. And um, we had some late additions, which were really exciting. Um, I, some of you may know, we got a wonderful gift of works by the artist Stephen Pace from his uh, foundation. Uh, and uh, in that group of work were three bird um, works, which were perfect for the exhibition. This um, main seagulls on the left, and then a, a lithograph of a very similar subject, and then a beautiful great blue heron um, ink drawing. So we added those in. And then literally, I think we were about to go to press um, and I got in the mail an exhibition brochure from Herschel and Adler Galleries in New York and they were exhibiting Elizabeth Turk's um, work. So these two works on the right, which while they might look kind of um, not like birds to you, um, they are the, um, the uh, bird song, you know, the, the vocalizations, the sound waves of of these birds. So it's the bald eagle and the Carolina parakeet. And uh, it was touch and go whether we were going to able to be able to borrow them. But in the end, we um, were able to get these two, which was just thrilling to me because these also kind of mesh with the whole scientific um, side to the exhibition to, to be showing sound waves um, instead of representations of the birds was, was really exciting. Next, please. And I just wanted to touch briefly on Art Bridges again. Um, you know, their their support um, brought that beautiful Marston Hartley painting to us. All expenses paid. They paid the packing, the shipping, the insurance, um, and they also gave us a grant for ten thousand dollars, which dollars, which allowed us to buy the camera, which does the virtual tours for our exhibitions now, which Michelle's going to demonstrate for you in a, in a minute. Um, so we are very grateful to them. They all, some of the money went to some other things. And then I just wanted to mention our community partners. Um, we reached out to both of the Audubon societies locally, and we've partnered with the Greenwich Audubon Center on two programs, one which has already happened, which you can watch on our YouTube channel, and one which is coming up, um, which I'll talk more about in at the end. Um, and then the Pequot Library lent us two um, rare books from their collection. And then they um, were uh, willing to bring out from storage their beautiful Audubon um, elephant folio bean edition of the uh, Audubon's Birds of America. So that's on view now at the Pequot for anyone who is watching this who is local. And for that reason, we didn't feel that we needed an actual Audubon in the exhibition and we could um, use um, the Matthew Day Jackson works instead. Next. 
And I'm going to uh, turn it over to Michelle. You're muted, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you, Carrie. Uh, we mentioned that we're gonna take advantage of the fact that we are virtual to show you a little bit more than um, Carrie and I would be able to if we were just standing in the gallery. And not just YouTube videos, but one of those things is all of the things that you can find on our website. Um, so if you visit, you can see the URL there at the top of the page. And I'm just going to um, briefly go through what is available. It's pretty much everything. We have done our best, especially in this period of closure, to make sure that you can experience the exhibition in as many ways as possible. Uh, Carrie just mentioned that with generous support from Art Bridges, we were able to invest in a Matterport camera, uh, which will make possible um, our virtual tours going forward. I'm not going to do anything more than let the sort of dollhouse effect play out. I'll invite you all to experiment with it on the website, only because we know from experience that it can be a little bit jarring uh, to watch someone else sort of bounce around. But this will let you move through the entire exhibition, read all of the wall labels. And another aspect of ArtBridge's funding was that we were able to make the entire exhibition bilingual. So if you are you know, going through the exhibition in person on Fairfield's campus, if you are a faculty, staff, or student, you would see um, QR codes that you could snap with your phone and it would take you to the Spanish translation of every label, the scientific information, the scientific names. And there's also a Spanish language version version of our website with a Spanish language Matterport tour. So all of these little dots that you see popping up are would let you, I'll just show you our main label here, would pop up and just show you the text that's available on the wall. The same video tour that I already showed you that was on our YouTube page is also permanently embedded here. You can also flick through um, a few of our selected highlights and you probably recognize by now a few of those that Carrie has already lingered on and a few others that we'll be showing you in just a moment. If you'd rather listen to a few of uh, the labels, you can listen to our audio guide. And we also have digital versions of our publications. So the full catalog for the show with an introductory essay by Brian Walker, who's one of the biology faculty members who co-curated with Carrie, is available for you to read online or to download. And we also have the wonderful Birds of Fairfield guide the same. Both of those guides are available in English and Spanish. And if anyone is listening and thinking that they would really just like a physical object to hold instead of another digital item, please send us an email. We are more than happy to send you copies of each of these. And our wonderful intern, Ann Panos, also put together a YouTube playlist of all of the available bird sounds of the living birds in the exhibition. So not all of the extinct birds in the exhibition have recorded sounds with the exception, I think, of the Carolina parakeet, which is the subject of one of Elizabeth Turk's wonderful 3D prints. Carrie had mentioned that uh, one of the great things about doing this interdisciplinary exhibition is that we were able to sort of cast our net wide in terms of programming. And again, the virtues of the digital environment mean that we can capture all of these events and make them permanently available. If you didn't watch it live, you can go to our YouTube page, we also have the playlist embedded here. You see um, Dr. Drew Lanham, who gave a talk for us uh, last month. But if you go mouse over this playlist, it would take you to every one of the events. Um, you could go through them one by one if you were so inclined. And they're all listed out underneath. So Dr. Uh, Lanham is a wildlife ecologist. We also had an entomologist, Dr. Doug Tallamy, who spoke to us. As Carrie said, these are not usually the kinds of people that we are reaching out to for our art exhibitions. But with the wonderful input from our faculty partners, they were the ones who said, you should really invite this person. You should really invite that person. Uh, and then there are some that are a little bit more in our wheelhouse. So Carrie had the idea of inviting Jonathan Weinberg, who's a professor and artist at the Yale University School of Art and also at RISD, who talked about the Marsden Hartley painting that she will be giving us some highlights on in a moment. And we do have one upcoming um, event listed here that Carrie is also going to highlight at the end of our tour. And of course, if you would like to, especially if you're alumni, if you want to read about Fairfield University's name popping up in the press, especially in the Wall Street Journal, you can also go to the bottom of our website and see um, the places where the exhibition has been reviewed. And we felt very fortunate to have a show that is really virtual, that um, most people cannot visit in person, that they were willing to uh, review it nonetheless. We were really pleased to have that. And it's such a wonderful article that I encourage everyone to read it. So with that, we will leave the website. And we'll go back to the first of our highlights. 
So as we were watching the intro video, this is in the um, the smaller back gallery, which was, I don't think Carrie had mentioned this, was devoted exclusively to lost birds. So she had mentioned that a strong driver in her goal for the show was focusing on conservation, on the potential for loss of habitat, but then in partnering with Todd McGrain, looking at birds for whom the moment is already passed. So she'll talk about his sculptures that are elsewhere on campus that also have bronze maquettes that are in the back gallery. And we filled that space with other artistic uh, representations of these extinct birds and also some um, scientific materials. You might have seen the skeleton of the, the great auk, which the video beautifully lingers over. But this piece, Walton Ford's Dying Words, when I saw this on the checklist, I, this is the one that captivated me the most. And part of it is it's just so beautifully colorful. And part of it is, you know, the art historian in me going, I know what that's supposed to be. Uh, because this is a riff on a very famous 18th century grand history painting called The Death of General Wolfe by the American turned British artist, Benjamin West. Um, I did do an art and focus event on this. So if you are really interested in hearing more about Walton Ford, you can look on our YouTube page for that very short sort of 20 minute segment. But effectively what Walton Ford did, he took this canonical painting of Western art history that is in all the survey textbooks that sort of told this foundation myth of uh, white colonists in battling for North America. So the death of a British general who's being observed by this quote unquote noble savage at the lower left. He took that narrative of battle and colonization and he turned it into a story about the death of the species, the Carolina parakeet. So we're seeing one wounded parakeet who's taking the place of the dying general. You see some sort of blood leaking out of its breast. And the other beautifully colored parakeets are gathered around it and they're on these very strange branches. And what's amazing about this artist is that it's sort of satirical, it's sort of darkly comic because you know art history meets extinct birds, but he also wove in aspects of the actual story of the species, namely that they uh, were initially very helpful to colonists and settlers because they ate the cockleburrs, which is the sort of invasive weed that they're clinging to. Once those were all gone and they turned their attention to the agricultural crops, that's when humans in North America started hunting them. And the way they're portrayed here in this sort of communal setting, attending to a dying member of the species, reflects what was part of their actual, um, their actual habits. So they were a communal bird species, and when one was shot, other birds would gather around it, which unfortunately had the side effect of making all of them a greater target for ultimately extinction. So I love that all of this comes together in what is not a very large um, etching, you might have seen it there on the wall. It's pretty small, brilliantly colorful, and just does a, such a wonderful job of bringing together a lot of the themes that are in our show with this sort of darkly comic sense of humor. So certainly my pick for one of the one of the highlights of the exhibition. And now Carrie is going to take over and talk about her favorite. As, as I as I alluded to earlier, um, this really was the the painting that. Um, set me on my way with this exhibition. I'm a big fan of Marston Hartley. There was a beautiful retrospective of his um, work at the um, Met Breuer um, a number of years ago. And uh, this painting was in that exhibition. And so for those of you who don't know Marston Hartley too well, um, he was working in the 20s, 30s, 40s, um, died in 1943, died quite young, um, never, had a hugely successful career during his lifetime, but has become one of the iconic painters of that period. Um, he was the self-proclaimed painter from Maine. So many of his um, paintings um, deal with subjects like this of the, of the Maine coast um, and of people from Maine. Um, <laughs> the paint, this painting, um, I just loved the painting. Um, but since uh, I've uh, had it in my exhibition, I've learned a lot more about it. Um, Art Bridges sent us a label with it, a wall label, and their interpretation of the painting is very, um, this is actually, we didn't plan this. It's a great segue from, from the um, Walton Ford etching. Um, th they see this as a very traditionally composed um, landscape, but with a whole, second layer of meaning. Um, 
They say that the painting references the Lord's Prayer. And while the depicted fish in the foreground function as memento mori, they also suggest both Christ's identity as a fisherman and of the bi biblical story of loaves and fishes. Likewise, they, they suggest that the central figure of the um, seagull with the single eye um, recalls traditional depictions of the Holy Spirit as a dove and balances reminders of mortality with the promise of redemption. Well, we had this fantastic lecture from Dr. Jonathan Weinberg, who has written extensively on Hartley, and he brought us a completely different interpretation of the painting, which is not to say that the first one is incorrect. We don't know what Hartley was thinking, but um, Dr. Weinberg suggests that um, when um, Hartley was not doing well, um, he was ill and depressed, he went to Nova Scotia for a change of scenery and he lived with a family called the Mason family. And uh, he, he was very happy during his time there until tragically, so it was a mother, a father, and then three children, two boys and a, a, a daughter. Um, and um, Marston Hartley was gay and he was very um, fond of the two Mason boys, Alti and Donnie. And um, as I said, he was very happy during his time there. And then the two sons and a cousin tragically died in a fishing accident. They drowned during a, a sudden storm. So his, and, and Hartley was devastated by this. So his interpretation of this painting is that um, he, it's known that he, he really meditated on these deaths for quite a while. So they died in 36 and this was painted in 38, but he painted several paintings that are, everyone believes were kind of while he was processing this, this enormous loss. So uh, Wy Dr. Weinberg views this as the uh, three seagulls on the right as the three children in the Mason family, the father figure in the center, the mother on the left, and the little seagull on the upper left is Har uh, Marston Hartley himself kind of as a voyeur. And then the three fish are the, the bodies of, the, of the, the three who perished in the, um, in the in the terrible accident of drowning. So it's very, very interesting. Again, we're art history nerds, but we I just I love that there are all these meanings in this, you know, really just beautiful seascape of the main coast. Um, so Michelle, your turn. <laughs> so this uh, Carrie said was one of the the real sort of driving forces of the show that she said this particular set of prints grabs her. I think it grabs everyone who walks into the gallery because it is occupying, as you saw in the introductory video, it's occupying that main wall when you walk in right underneath the English and Spanish titles of the show, Matthew Day Jackson's um, There Will Come Soft Rains. And so it's, it's meant to be um, perceived together because it is a portfolio, it is a set of these 12 prints. And as Carrie alluded to, um, Matthew Day Jackson was able to get his hands on an original set of Audubon plates, which I don't think we've even fully understood exactly how he obtained them. But so he was able to sort of return to the source in terms of John James Audubon's Birds of America, but to remix them with a message that is very different. And he took the title of his portfolio and added onto each one of these 12 prints, one line from a poem from 1918 by Sarah Teasdale. Um, which is also called There Will Come Soft Rains. And that was a poem reflecting on a time after humanity, written in the time of the Great War, and as we are also now thinking about in the time of the first great pandemic of the Spanish influenza. So to give you a little bit of an um, opportunity to see these two together, we had the Media Center do another wonderful little video for us where I'm going to be treated to the sound of my own voice, reading the poem aloud as we go through the images. There will come soft rains and the smell of the ground and swallows circling with their shimmering sound and frogs in the pool singing at night and wild plum trees in tremulous white. Robins will wear their feathery fire, whistling their whims on a low fence wire. And not one will know of the war, not one. 
will care at last when it is done. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly, and spring herself, when she woke at dawn, would scarcely know that we were gone. So that wonderful image of the turkey that is the first in the series that Carrie had shown before is almost sort of the most, um, I would say, deceptively normal looking one. It just looks like a recolored Audubon. But as you start to look at the others, the backgrounds that he has mixed in are suggestive of, of disease, of wildfire, of you know, nuclear devastation. And it takes on a much um, sort of more complex and darker tone, especially when read in conjunction with Teasdale's poem. So I don't think there could be anything that's sort of more evocative of the moment that we are now in. And, you know, look where we are having this virtual experience of the show together. Uh, but it is it's really extraordinary and it was incredible. I believe the Wall Street Journal article referred to it as a coup that Carrie was able to arrange for loan of Jackson's portfolio. So it's, it's really incredible. Carrie, that Thanks. takes us to James Prosek. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so James Prosek is a great friend of the museums. Um, we had an exhibition, a solo exhibition of his work um, early on in the um, museum's history, I think uh, 2012. Um, for those of you who don't know James, he's an artist, a writer, a naturalist. He's published, written and published 12 books. He's done videos, uh, films. Uh, he's actually a singer, songwriter as well. He's, he's incredible. Um, but uh, I, I chose this work to focus on because um, for those of you who are bird lovers, and I'm sure there's some of you who are watching this just because you love birds, this will probably be immediately familiar to you because what he has done in this body of work, and he's done this for a couple of years, um, he's really gotten very interested in silhouettes, but he was inspired to this idea of silhouette by Roger Torrey Peterson, who was one of the um, earliest uh, naturalists, co conservationists in America. He founded his Guide to the Birds um, in 1934. And if you've ever seen a Roger Torrey Peterson bird guide, it looks just like this, except the bird is in silhouette as well. And it's not round. Um, but uh, it, his guide was a, an enormous success. I think it's, you know, had six editions over the, decades um, and it's now been supplanted by more more realist by photographs and more realistic guides but it, it was the standard for many many years um, so this is a wood duck and um, wood ducks are, are native to Connecticut and um, I, I think among the most beautiful um, ducks anyway if not birds they just have this very these very iridescent feathers. So the contrast of the um, of the black and white silhouette with the with the bright color of the wood deck, I think, is is fabulous. Uh, Michelle, on to you. Well, directly adjacent to James Prosek in the gallery and taking us to just a monochromatic lens is another wonderful friend of the museum, James Reed. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the museum may know that a couple of years ago, uh, Jim gave us a transformative gift of over 1,500 uh, prints from old master to contemporary with many more promised and also a huge number of his own prints. So he is both a master printmaker and an artist himself, as well as a collector. And as he himself will tell you, he doesn't love all birds. He loves one bird, and that bird is the American crow. And he became fascinated with crows and he was in an artist residency and he had come without really an idea of what he was going to work on and a pair of crows sort of taken up their own residency outside his studio. So from simply observing them for so long, he became utterly fascinated with them and they have become so the subject of a lot of his recent works. You're seeing three examples which take us from sort of the close up portrait to the uh, crow in flight to one perched on a branch. Jim's also a local artist. He's based in Bridgeport. If you went to his studio, not only would you see more depictions of crows, you would see several stuffed specimens, which for various reasons we were unable to borrow for the purposes of our exhibition. Uh, but it also, I think, is, is very fitting in that they, although the owl has traditionally in the West been um, perceived as the image of wisdom, what do we now know from science? The really intelligent bird is 
the crow and the other members of the corvid family. They are incredibly intelligent. So I think they should stand as sort of the symbol of, of cleverness and intelligence, especially in our university context. Back to Carrie. And, and we're going to end with the lost birds, um, which as I mentioned at the, at the beginning, were one of the drivers for this exhibition. And as Michelle so eloquently spoke, they really um, gave us the structure of the back gallery to take the five birds that Todd McGrain um, memorializes in his lost bird project. These are five birds that um, have gone extinct in modern times. And um, he, uh, we took those five birds and, and filled the gallery with them, including the specimens, which again, that's not something you would normally see in an art exhibition. So it, it just, it's, it's a really wonderful added feature, I think. Um, I should give credit to the um, Yale Peabody, Peabody um, Museum of Natural History who lent all of the specimens in the exhibition. But um, Todd McGrain's five lost birds are, are monumental sculptures. Um, they're about five to six feet tall um, and they are currently on our library lawn. I'll show you that. Oh, thank you, perfect. Um, so we have the three smaller maquettes in the back gallery and then um, just to, to kind of uh, reference these uh, these large birds. And then it, also in the back gallery are photographs and other studies that Todd did in, um, he had a year of uh, residency, um, artistic residency at the Cornell Ornithology Lab. And he um, was working on this project during his time there. So those photographs um, that you saw on the walls and some drawings and the maquettes are what created, you know, his artistic, artistic practice led to, led to these large scale birds. Um, uh, he's done a full length uh, film about the Lost Bird Project, um, which is fantastic. He also did a, a program for us in October when the birds arrived on campus, um, which you can watch on our YouTube channel, which is really entertaining. He's a great storyteller. And he will be back with us um, for our final Audubon, Greenwich Audubon um, program, which is happening on Earth Day, April 22nd. Uh, he's going to be uh, talking with the, a naturalist from the Audubon Center about bird extinction. And then, no, you can go ahead. And before, then- Before we go forward, I feel like you should have to do a pop quiz and name in order the extinct birds that are on screen. Oh, you're gonna put me on the spot. Um, okay. Uh, the, uh, Correct me if I get any wrong. Uh, we've got the gray dock on the left, then the passenger pigeon, Labrador duck, Carolina parakeet, and Heath hen. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, the same day, uh, April 22nd, Earth Day. Unfortunately, you will not be able to watch this live, but the uh, university has commissioned Palabolus Dance Troupe to perform their dance called Branches around the lost birds on a green library lawn. Um, and that will be filmed and it will be available on our YouTube channel probably a week or so after April 22nd. So you should definitely come back and look for that. We're, we're so excited for um, the birds to be used in this way. And I have to say, you know, art history classes and other classes have really enjoyed using them um, while they've been on campus um, as well. I think we're, oh, I've got, do I have, so this is uh, the little promo from our Eventbrite page about the um, Greenwich Audubon program. And then the next one is um, the program that Michelle mentioned. Uh, Roberta Olson um, is going to be speaking about John James Audubon. That's gonna be fantastic next week. So we hope you will tune in for those. And um, as Michelle said, please email us if you would like any bird brochures and we would be happy to answer any questions that you have. And Jessica, I don't know if you, if you can see if there are any questions, feel free to tell us. Yeah, no, I'm not seeing anything come through. I think you guys gave so much information, you probably <laughs> covered anything people were wondering about. This was awesome. It was so interesting to hear all the different forms of uh, the art that you have, all the different mediums, and thank you so much for showing us the video and the virtual tour. There's so many incredible tools available now in this virtual time, and you certainly have made use of all of them. So thank you so much. Oh, You're welcome. And I see there's a, a comment from Diane just wondering when we might open to the public. 
We are certainly opening, uh, hoping this, uh, wondering the same. And it all depends on as we're part of the university and we have our fingers crossed for the future. That's that's all we can say. Uh, we were discussing with the Office of Alumni Relations, though, that going forward in future semesters, we are more than happy to continue doing virtual tours, especially for those of you who might be alumni in far flung places uh, who will not be able to come to the museum in person. We are more than happy to keep doing things like this and we will continue to make our programs uh, the recorded programs available on our YouTube page in the future. And if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to email me or Carrie, and we'll do our best to answer them unless they're biology questions, in which case we will refer you on to the appropriate <laughs> experts. Uh, I have a comment. Um, uh, I'm calling in from San Francisco, and uh, I'm a physician, but also uh, I have a PhD in um, botany and in the relationship between humans and birds. And so I just wanted to say I'm really excited to see an exhibit that combines science and art. And I think there's something really powerful about the kind of collaboration that you guys created. And I don't, I wish there was more of that because I think there was a lot of, we all have to put our heads together to kind of think about the emotional weight of all this species loss and all of the changes in our earth. And there is like this, sense of collective grieving that I really felt as you guys showed the virtual exhibit. And I really appreciate that. And I feel like people are really looking for an outlet. I know I am to kind of talk about these issues in, in an open, not in a politically necessarily charged way, but in a, in a just sort of how do we honor lives that are being lost and how do we protect what we have and not feel so disempowered by just the weight of all that's happening because the numbers are pretty staggering. Three, million, three billion birds and I have heard that in the last 50 years. So um, I'm just wondering if there are more planned ideas like this um, at, at, the, at the university. And also um, what are some of the like things that surprised you guys about working with different types of faculty? Hmm. Um, it sounds like one thing that was really surprising was that they had their own ideas about who you could talk to and you guys had your ideas. And so I just wondered if you could talk about the collaboration. A bit about that. Yeah, the, the programming um, was, was really fun. Um, but really, you know, it, it, all of the scientific aspects of the exhibition came from the biology faculty. It would never have occurred to me to put specimens in the exhibition if it hadn't been for their suggestions. And I think it's so powerful to have them in there um, and so interesting. And, you know, people don't understand the, and, you know, we haven't had a lot of chance to, to, to share it with people beyond the wall labels, but specimens are so important. And, you know, it's so much scientific study depends on specimens. Um, so I love that the video kind of zoomed in on the label and you got to have a sense of like all the material that was recorded there. But um, no, it was really a pleasure um, collaborating with our, our biology colleagues. They made the exhibition much richer um, and, and three-dimensional. I mean, we think art, art exhibitions are three-dimensional just in and of themselves, but I, I think the added scientific um, part of it. And thank you for your comments so eloquently um, shared. Um, yeah, it, it is great to be able to have a place for people to um, have conversations about these issues. So we were really happy to be able to provide that. I just want to say one last thing. Um, I'm really excited that you guys are going to do more virtual exhibits. Um, I've been a fan of your of UT page, and I've actually thought about you becoming a donor, even though I'm not an alumni. And I feel like there's really an opportunity out there to connect with all kinds of people through this medium. And I think you guys did a really excellent job of kind of bringing us into the exhibit, even though like I've never even heard of Fairfield University. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. You know, yeah, now, so I, now I'm you totally have. <laughs> checking out your digital resources and kind of like, you know, signing up for these talks and things like that. And so um, thank you for that, continuing to do that. I think that there's just like a wellspring of people that would love to see more. Well, we're Thank so you. delighted. We're... Sorry. No, go ahead. We're so delighted by um, the, the reach that our programs have had. And you're a great example of that. But, you know, we've reached people from all over the world at this point with, with our digital programs. And it's very, very rewarding for us to know that people are interested in what we're doing. Yeah, and I'm sure all museums are thinking about this now. But as we look to a post-pandemic future, there's the question of, you know, how much do you do in person and how much do you continue to do virtual because you're balancing the people who want the in-person experience of a work of art and to sit in a room with a speaker and share ideas 
And then there's the question of access and reach. And we want our exhibitions to be as widely accessible as possible. Um, so we are going to try to walk that that fine line in the future. And we also, as you so eloquently have pointed out, we, we are excited about interdisciplinary opportunities. And although not all of our exhibitions are as obviously interdisciplinary as biology and art history, one of the things we do sort of internally at Fairfield, we always have a couple of faculty liaisons who give us ideas for programming, things that we wouldn't have thought of, ideas for speakers and programs. So, and they're sometimes a little bit less visible to the outside world, but they are so often what makes an exhibition really strong. So at Fairfield, we are so privileged to have so many talented colleagues to work with. Um, and I'll just say too, what surprised us, Carrie, if you recall, we learned that specimens aren't even called specimens, they're called study skins which the first time our biology college said that, we're like, and that means what exactly? <laughs> and then we learned. So it's all about learning to speak each other's languages a little bit. Yeah. Any other questions, Jessica? No, I'm not seeing anything else. Just lots of kudos in the comments. So well done to both of you. And thank you so much to both Carrie and Michelle for your time and all of you for attending tonight. I hope you all enjoyed it. And if you want to check out any of our future events, you can visit fairfield.edu slash alumni events and all of our virtual offerings are on there. So we hope to see you again soon and have a great night. Thanks so thank much. You. Thanks have a good for night. Coming.